Dick Durbin on the Supreme Court nominee and more. Catching up with one of the greatest athletes of all time, Illinois' own Jackie Joyner Kersey. We're not people who do gymnastics, we're gymnasts. It's, it's a lifestyle um, and to have that opportunity taken, taken away is really difficult. The University of Illinois Chicago Athletic Department plans to cut a long-standing athletic tradition. A new book tells the story of how a showman saved thousands of premature babies in the early 20th century. It is an art form that anyone can learn. Visit the only mosaic school in the United States, which has pieced together a big and brand new home in Chicago's Edgewater neighborhood. And as Lincoln Park Zoo celebrates its 150th anniversary, hear from the, the director on the zoo's vision for the 21st century. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. The latest on the race for Chicago mayor. Amanda Vinicky has that and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Phil, operatives for Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle say she'll have an announcement shortly as to whether she'll run for mayor of Chicago, but her campaign's already acting as if it's a go. Petitions are circulating to get her on the February ballot. She's not the only Cook County official looking at the race. Cook County Treasurer Maria Pappas tells Chicago Tonight she is considering running for mayor and already has petitions printed. Pappas says it's because she's seriously concerned about the direction of the city. She's forming an exploratory committee and plans a poll. Meanwhile, there's no quibbling for community activist William Doc Walls, who came up short in three previous bids for mayor. Walls took to social media to say he's running again this cycle. The man who kicked off the political shuffle by announcing he won't be in the 2019 contest spent today heralding gains at Chicago Public Schools. Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel out with a new CPS report card. Emanuel's praising graduation rate gains, higher math and reading scores, and a spike in money for scholarships with a program that lets all students with a B average go to community college for free. To all the naysayers, to all the people that say not those kids, not from that part of town, not that background. I'll get you your own student ID here at Hyde Park High School and see what I see. 92% freshman on track graduation, setting new records. Emmanuel was at Hyde Park Academy to announce a $40 million infusion of cash for the Southside High School. Thousands of Chicago hotel workers striking for a fifth day. Housekeepers, cooks, and doormen and women walked out Friday with demands for raises, health insurance, sick days, and protection from sexual harassment. Their contracts expired at the end of last month. 26 hotels, including those run by Marriott, Hilton, and Hyatt, the Drake, the Doubletree on the Mag Mile, both W's, and the Allegro are among those affected. Employees of a handful of other hotels, such as the Fairmont and Park Hyatt, could still join in. As for the weather, clear skies tonight and a low of 59 degrees. Tomorrow, once again, gorgeous and sunny with a high of about 79. Now, Phil, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. And you never have to miss Chicago tonight. Watch as we stream on Facebook via podcast and the PBS video app at app that is as well as online at wttw.com slash chicago tonight and now to eddie arusa with senator dick durbin eddie phil president trump's controversial nominee to the u.s supreme court judge brett kavanaugh appears on course to be the new conservative justice on the bench but last week's senate judiciary committee hearings on his confirmation had its share of drama chaos protesters and deep partisanship over kavanaugh's nomination Illinois' senior senator Dick Durbin has been a member of the Judiciary Committee for most of the last 20 years. And in 2006, when Brett Kavanaugh was nominated to the U.S. Court of Appeals, Senator Durbin asked him about emails that had been hacked from the senator's computer and that Kavanaugh might have seen while working for the Bush White House. Here's how Kavanaugh responded in 2006. I did not know about any memos uh, from the Democratic side. I, was not, I did not suspect that 
Had I known or suspected that, I would have immediately told Judge Gonzalez, who I'm sure would have immediately uh, talked to Chairman Hatch about it. I did not know about it, did not suspect it. But emails released during last week's hearing appear to contradict Judge Kavanaugh's denial from 12 years ago. And joining us tonight to talk about that and some big local news is Senator Dick Durbin. Senator Durbin, always great to have you in the studio here. Thanks, Thanks. for coming in. Good to be back. So you've had doubts about Brett Kavanaugh going back not just to that 2006 hearing, but to a 2004 hearing. Has anything been clarified for you after last week's hearing? No, the situation is even worse because I asked him questions about William uh, Haynes, who was a nominee who ultimately withdrew and his involvement in detention mem memos and the like and again uh, Brett Kavanaugh said I have nothing to do with that it wasn't part of my agenda well now in the last few days documents have come out to prove that he did in fact uh, get involved in the nomination of Mr. Haynes uh, and gave advice and, and clearly contradicted what he said to me same thing true about detention and interrogation three different occasions we have documents that prove he was involved even though he said under oath he was not and you believe he's perjured himself? I wouldn't, I'm not going to use the word perjure because it uh, is a criminal term. I will tell you that I do not believe he was honest with us under oath. I don't believe he gave us a complete and accurate answer under oath. Your Republican colleagues, though, don't seem to see that or don't really care. What, what's your sentiment? Well, that's the same group that decided to leave that Supreme Court vacancy after Anton Scalia's passing for 400 days and deny President Obama a chance to fill it. And they were perfectly happy to just say, no, we're not going to do it. And now they've changed the rules when it comes to discovery when it, for Supreme Court nominees. They wrote the rules. They told us when it came to Sotomayor, when it came to Elena Kagan, this is what we want. We want to go back in time. We want it all. And we said, fine, open the record, take a look. And now when it comes to their nominee, they've closed the record for about 93% of all the documents related to his public service. So at this point, do you see him on the fast track to being confirmed, save maybe one of your Republican colleagues, Senators Collins or Murkowski, uh, deciding to vote no? After the vacancy was filled, John McCain's passing, it takes two. It'll take two Republicans to uh, make the difference in the ultimate vote if all Democrats vote against Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, at this point, there's no indication that those Republican senators will do that, but a few days, a few weeks remain before the final vote. Let's move on to some big local news, uh, and that is the, the, the now wide open um, mayoral race here in Chicago. And you got a call from the current occupant of the uh, fifth floor of City Hall. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I was in the middle of the Kavanaugh hearing, and I look at my phone, and there's a message from Rahm Emanuel. What's this? I thought. I mean, I didn't expect a call from him left the, uh, the hearing room, went off in the corridor there and said, what's up? He said, uh, my wife and I, Amy, just dropped our last child off uh, at school. We come home to an empty nest and I'm not running again. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I thought for sure he would run for re-election. He'd raised the money, made every indication he was going to be a candidate. But he said he'd reached a point in his life where he decided this was not the thing he wanted to do. There are now a lot of either announced candidates or potential candidates or candidates that are exploring the possibility. Any, any name right now that jumps at, uh, out at you that uh, could be a worthy successor? As of this taping and the announced candidates, I don't think there's anyone that could clear the field. Uh, that may change. I don't know who will announce next. I've heard a lot of uh, rumors and a few people have called me and said they're taking a hard look at it. But no, I think it's a wide open contest at this moment. Well, let me throw out a couple names at you. One is the Cook County Board President, Tony Preckwinkle. The other is one of your colleagues in the House, Luis Gutierrez. What do you think of either one of them? It's amazing. It's interesting to me. I, it never had crossed my mind to think of uh, Luis Gutierrez, for example, in the context of running for mayor. But I've certainly worked with him. I, I believe he is a determined, uh, well-informed uh, politician who picks an issue and really devotes himself, and I think he feels that passionately about the city. He was an alderman at one point before being in Congress, so he knows city issues a little better than most. Tony Preckwinkle, I've worked on, with her for years on critical issues involving Cook County. Some of them were historic under President Obama when we extended the reach of county cares so that more and more people were Medicaid eligible. I've seen a reform of Stroger Hospital, dramatic reform under her leadership, so I have a great respect for her ability. So you'd be able to support either one of them if they oh, jump I like the them race. both, and I've worked with both of them, and uh, you know, I don't, I'm not 
picking my favorite at this point, but I will tell you they're both excellent candidates. So you are not uh, a legal resident of Chicago. No. You're a downstate resident. But if you were, would you jump in the race? Would you consider it at this point in well, your career? It would be interesting to move from the United States Senate to the mayor's spot. But I remember being down in Springfield as a kid lawyer for years and years and watching all these people in the General Assembly giving up spots in the General Assembly to become an alderman. And it seemed upside down. You know, if you know the hierarchy of government, you'd say, well, they're leaving a, a higher level job. In but Chicago it is an important District, job and one of the most important in the nation uh, to be the mayor of a great city. And this well, is a great city. It has great challenges. So whoever is the next mayor faces a lot of challenges. They'll be inheriting a number of issues from this mayor. One is probably going to be, not probably, it's, it's going to likely be the, the issue of violence. Over the weekend, you, you tweeted out a, uh, uh, you, well, you tweeted about the violence in Chicago, and it received some pushback because you, you're essentially saying that it's the Republicans in Congress who need to decide to act in order to curb the violence here in Chicago. And some of that pushback came in, well, where is the Democratic response? Where are the officials here in the city that have been responsible for the city? Here's what I think. Uh, the federal government can't solve this problem, but it's almost indispensable to addressing it in a responsible way. There are resources that could come out of Washington and make a difference in terms of making the community and neighborhoods safer and in terms of addressing this whole fundamental issue of trauma-induced violence. Uh, I've been studying this. I went to the Cook County Juvenile Facility. Uh, there's a high school in that building because some of these criminal defendants, adolescents, are held for a year or more. And I sat down with the counselors and said, who are these kids? They aren't born with a gun in their hands. How do they end up doing these outrageous, senseless, violent things? Well, they said 92% of these kids have been exposed to trauma, either on themselves, in their houses, in their lives. And we know what trauma does to our returning veterans who need a helping hand. Imagine if it was a six-year-old who went through this experience. So what I'm trying to do, and I'm gonna make an announcement in a few weeks on this issue, what I'm trying to do is to get to the bottom of this question of what we can do to make a safer Chicago, starting with the families that live here, starting with the kids who, as I said, were came to the earth in the usual way. Well, can you give us a preview of what it is that you I'm plan to I'm gonna save propose? that for another day. But I'll tell you, on, on this track, I just left Rockford. They're about to create a family justice center They've decided that domestic violence is at the root of the problems they have with guns and crime in their community. And they're going after a direct effort to solve it. We helped them get some money, $450,000 from Washington to create this center. And I think they're gonna prove something. How would you rate the mayor on how he has responded? Because again, he's received a lot of criticism. The mental health facilities in a lot of these low income and neediest communities have been closed. This, there was a massive school closing in a lot of these communities. The development that, uh, that, that, that leaders in, in the communities with the highest violence have been pleading for development, have been pleading for more resources and jobs there, and it doesn't seem to have come. So is that something that the mayor fell, sh for, felt, fell short on? I think there were many things he did which were really important and positive. Uh, the improvement of the outcomes in schools. I mean, that really can set a child's life off on the right track. Uh, the professionalism in the police department and, the br and bringing in new technology, amazing technology that is making a difference on dealing with violence. But I re really think the next mayor, whoever it's going to be, needs to look a little deeper. What is it that we can do in these neighborhoods, in these houses, in these families and communities that will make a difference in the lives of these children? Of course, put someone to work if they can physically do it, but beyond that, to try to give some hopes and ambitions to these young people that they don't have today. Did the mayor not do enough of that? Well, he, he used his approach, it, the Rahm Emanuel approach to it. It would be different than the Durban approach or someone else's. But I, I know he took it seriously. I know he was heartbroken so many times by what was occurring in this what great city. What would have citizen. been the Durban approach? Well, I'm much more hands-on. Uh, I will tell you, when they would have identified these dangerous neighborhoods, I would have been there. I, I wish I could remember that she's been a guest on uh, out here at the station, the young lady who sits on the street corner every night giving out free food. Uh, I sat there with her one night and watched the young people coming by, some of the poorest people in the city. And I'm thinking, these kids are going to walk home now to an empty refrigerator. Thank goodness she's offering them a hot dog. So, you know, I, I really think I'm more of a hands-on kind of person when it comes to that sort of thing. Uh, let's get back to Washington because there's so much news coming out of there and the, the, the lack 
of, of bipartisanship is, is really one of the things that, I guess, impacts you the most. Where are the Democrats? Where are you reaching across the aisle and trying to bridge this enormous gap that exists? That, that is a, you know, it's almost a misnomer to say that there's no bipartisanship. It goes on every day in the Senate chamber. There could be more. Well, give us some examples. That's why well, I can asking. give you an example. Criminal sentencing reform, one of the most serious issues facing our nation. It, you know, it's Chuck Grassley, the Republican senator from Iowa. He and I are co-sponsoring it with Mike Lee, Republican of Utah. And I believe that we can get this achieved and do it with the Trump administration. We are expecting, hoping, fingers crossed, that the conference committee coming out on the health and education bill will have an amendment, which I offered again with Senator Grassley, to require the drug companies to publicize the price of the drug on their ads as an effort to try to slow down the dramatic increase in the cost of prescription drugs. I'm working on other issues. In fact, one's going to be announced tomorrow. I've been sworn to secrity. Uh, again, I'm sorry to say. But it you is can't a, give us any preview uh, of things that are upcoming. I can just tell you that it relates to public health and children, and it was totally bipartisan start to finish. You've had a lot of concerns, criticisms, worries about this administration. There is this new Bob Woodward uh, book that uh, seems to expose quite a lot of chaos and, and dysfunction within the, the White House. And then this uh, op-ed in the New York Times by an anonymous source within the Trump administration. Give me a reaction to all of this. It's scary, it's frightening, it's dangerous to think that uh, this president is so unpredictable, so unstable, that there would be people around him trying to guard him against his worst impulses. This is a man with the power of commander in chief of the United States of America, who controls the greatest military in the world and a nuclear arsenal unparalleled. And to think that people have to watch carefully that they don't put the wrong paper on his desk for fear he'll sign it in a moment of anger. And you believe that that anecdote is true? I do. That, that people are removing papers from his desk so that he doesn't sign them or view them? I do. Have you had any meetings with the president or do you talk to him? Does he ever call you or do you call him? I mean, is that a, a reality in, with this administration? I had a pretty dramatic episode with him on January the 11th of this year uh, where I was one of 12 people in the Oval Office, the only Democrat, where he made some comments about s-hole countries. Uh, that's the last time I was invited in the Oval Office, but I could not believe the words that came out of this president's mouth. What do you think will happen after the midterms and after the new Congress uh, is, is sworn in? If the House does flip, maybe the Senate, maybe Mr. Mueller will have something to say in the, in the coming year. What, what do you think the second half of the Trump, administ uh, Trump term is, is going to be? You know, I've been in this business for a while, and I've had a lot of questions asked of me over the years. But I have a question that is asking me over and over again when I come home every weekend. And the question is this. Are we going to be all right? Is America going to be all right? There are people who believe that we have to make sure that this president does not go to extremes, that there is some countervailing force to keep him closer to the center line. Are your Republican colleagues secretly, or at least within the, the, the Senate itself, on board with your sentiments? Here's what they say. We don't like what he's doing. We don't like what he's saying. But we'll tell you that 85% of the Republicans back in our home states will march over a cliff for him. And that's what holds him back. And how do you answer that question? Are we going to be okay? I tell the people I believe in our Constitution, I believe in the fundamental values of the overwhelming majority of Americans, yes, we will be. We're going to come together as a nation, and we have our chance November 6th to set us on a better course. Senator Dick Durbin, thank you so much for coming in. Always appreciate it. Thank you. And now, Phil, back to you. Thanks, Eddie. Still to come on Chicago Tonight... The UIC Athletic Department is set to shut down the school's gymnastics programs. A new book explores how babies in incubators captivated American audiences in the early 20th century. The only mosaic school in the country expands to a new and bigger home on the north side of Chicago. And Lincoln Park Zoo turns 150. The zoo director talks about the challenges of leading the zoo into the 21st century. But first, she's been called one of the 50 greatest athletes of all time by ESPN and named the top female athlete of the 20th century by Sports Illustrated, among others. Illinois' own Jackie joyner Kersey set multiple track and field records and won six Olympic medals, including two golds in the heptathlon and one in the long jump, competing at four different Olympics from 1984 to 1996. Today, she runs her foundation providing resources and care 
care to neighbors in her hometown of East St. Louis. She was in Chicago today, though, and our Brandis Friedman spoke with her. Brandis, what exactly is she up to? Well, Phil, today she's in town for the Goodwin Lecture Series that's happening at our neighbors here, Northeastern Illinois University. It actually starts in just a few minutes. And you mentioned the foundation that she runs, the Jackie Joyner Kersey Foundation. Uh, but in addition, she does a lot of public speaking where she talks about her work with children um, and especially uh, her own journey. She grew up uh, low income in East St. Louis. And then, of course, she went on to become, as you said, one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century. But I had to ask her what she thinks about about what we've seen in women's sports lately, tennis especially. Those uh, young women are going to continue to be strong, continue to be outspoken, continue to bond and, and come together and, uh, and tell their truth, you know, and, and not be afraid, you know, to... Uh, Serena didn't like a call and she called it like she, you know, like she saw it. And, but I, I don't think it should diminish what she has accomplished both on and off the, the court. But I think she's a strong uh, role model, you know, for women in general. Do you think women's tennis has a sexism problem? I, w I don't want to say they have a uh, sexism problem, but it appears to be that. But, you know, but I think that's why you have strong women like Serena, you know, Billie Jean, you know, Zena Garrison, them all speaking up, you know, and, and, I, and I just think that it's uh, people are recognizing and, and then giving you a reason to pause and to, wow, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, they didn't say so-and-so to, you know, so, but I think they're continuing to fight battles, you know, uh, when it comes to equal pay, you know, uh, Tennis has been on the forefront of making sure that the women are getting uh, equal pay with the men. Uh, it would be great to continue to have that across the board in some of the other sports. And among those other sports, she definitely feels there's a need for more equity in women's track and field. Of course, that's her sport, but also in women's hockey and women's basketball, Phil. Brad, is her foundation in East St. Louis, uh, what kind of work does it do? Well, she says first it gets the children's attention uh, by kind of luring them in with sports. Uh, but she says it also provides a safe space for children to play and to get school to help to get help, excuse me, with their uh, school work through an after school program. But it also teaches lessons in life character development and leadership but then also with uh, I call it a little twist with movement and and in hopes of instilling this through our young people when they go through one of the class uh, on one day of course might just be on critical thinking getting them to think critically and then how this apply to them today and they might study Jackie Joyner as a nine-year-old but then also uh, having the courage having confidence respect you know, and, and then risk taken is one is good and bad risk. And one important part of what she talks about are how she overcame hurdles, literally and figuratively, in life. Today, through her work, she encourages young people to do the same. I think there's always challenges in life. Uh, you got to stay true to who you are. And, and I think that's, for me, that's very important. And uh, to always elevate, you know, and I have a standard of excellence, and that's what I'm always working towards. And not to compromise my belief for anyone. And Jackie Joyner Kersey acknowledges that the kids she works with, they have a different growing up experience there in East St. Louis than the one that she had. She says kids today have a lot more technology. Um, and of course, we all know, Phil, that can come with benefits as well as bullying. Brandis, thank you. And speaking of athletes, high school and collegiate gymnastics programs are nationwide are in decline. For instance, in 1981, there were 79 men's NCAA gymnastics teams. Now there are only 16. One local university now intends to enter a tradition that has been decades in the making. <laughs> 19-year-old Asad Juma is the only male gymnast from the University of Illinois at Chicago who qualified for the NCAA Division I championships this past April. It was held at UIC Pavilion. It was incredible being, you know, a part of that kind of experience, especially on my home turf. I'm training everything to try to be, you know, a contender for the 2020 Olympics. Despite that promising future, gymnasts on UIC's men's and women's teams were shocked last month when the school's athletic department announced this season would be the last for both teams. You've got to keep pressure as you're bringing the toes up off the bar to create the lift you need. 
The men's team's head coach, Charlie Nelson, said it's more than a sport for his 25 athletes. We're not people who do gymnastics. We're gymnasts. It's, it's a lifestyle. Um, and to have that opportunity taken, taken away is really difficult. Officials from UIC's athletic department declined to be interviewed but issued a statement which points to alignment with other Horizon League conference schools that don't offer varsity gymnastics as well as rapidly rising costs. But Nelson says his team's expenses are a drop in the bucket compared to other UIC sports budgets. For one thing, male gymnasts don't get scholarships. All these guys are paying their way and doing everything you're seeing because that's what they want to do. And Nelson says the team's equipment is funded by donors. This t-shirt I'm wearing to the hand guards that they're on and this brand new floor exercise, uh, which was a major capital outlay, uh, but that was all donor supported. This is the 70th year for UIC's men's gymnastics team. The women's team, which practices in the same space, along with baseball batting practice, does offer scholarships to its athletes. The athletic department says it will honor the remaining scholarships, but some of the athletes are on the fence. If I'm getting a scholarship for gymnastics, I want to be doing gymnastics. So, I mean, I worked, I worked since I was four years old, and I mean, I've always been working to get a college scholarship, and then you finally get it, and then they just take it away. Tony Alecki came to UIC from Germany after competing on the German national team in the 2014 Youth Olympics. When I think about it, it's not real to me, but I called my mom and my dad. Obviously, they were all shocked, and they were like, just enjoy this year and then see what's coming. Push the limit every time. The women's team head coach Peter Jansen says a recent venue change for UIC gymnastics may be behind the administration's decision. In quality of the competition, fantastic venue, really, really good. But the cost it cost to put us in the pavilion also made us very expensive, $10,000, $12,000 per home competition. We used to go out in the big gym that's right next to us here. We would set up the equipment and we would do it and it would basically be a zero cost. And I feel in this case, we ended up being the scapegoat for some of the financial woes that the department has. High bar is my favorite, so I'm gripped up, ready to go. UIC sophomore A.J. Harden got started in the sport at Schomburg High School. It's gonna hurt not just us in the gym, but future kids around the world or even in Illinois who are considering to come here. So you're definitely taking away a good sport, a unique sport from everybody, and you know it's gonna hurt the community. Both teams are training for perhaps the most important season of their lives starting this January. Coach Nelson said his athletes deserve every opportunity to compete. It's amazing. Excuse me. It's amazing to see a group of guys who are, are begging to take this kind of punishment. You're taking a significant risk every time. And so that's a shared experience um, that makes these guys pretty unique. Coaches, athletes, and alumni say they intend to keep lobbying UIC's athletic department to keep the gymnastics programs alive. Up next, how a showman saved thousands of premature babies in the early 20th century. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Inland Real Estate Group of Companies. The Inland Real Estate Group of Companies is a national financial and commercial real estate group. Always building for tomorrow, Inland has conducted over $44 billion in commercial property transactions over the last 50 years. Inland owns, manages, finances, and invests in major retail shopping centers, apartments, large-scale construction projects, student housing, and medical office and healthcare facilities. The Inland Real Estate Group of Companies Incorporated, born in Chicago, at home in the world of commercial real estate since 1968. To learn more, visit inlandgroup.com. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, premature babies were not deemed worth saving if born with complications. But one person, a showman, thought that they were and demonstrated the possibility by traveling coast to coast to display incubators with live babies at his sideshows. His story and impact on modern medicine are explored in a new book called The Strange Case of Dr. Cooney, 
how a mysterious European showman saved thousands of American babies. And joining us is the author, Don Raffle. Don Raffle, welcome to Chicago tonight. First of all, uh, this is a remarkable story. Why is it that more people have not heard of this Dr. Cooney? Thank you. Well, you know, I think there's so many interesting historical stories that get a little bit buried. And I also think sometimes medical history is written from within the academy, and this guy was the ultimate outsider. Speaking of the academy, what was the hospital, hospital environment like for premature babies at the time, uh, quote, Dr. Cooney uh, came, to, uh, came to the public eye? It wasn't great. It was really a mixed bag, and certainly there were wonderful doctors trying very hard to save preemies, but there were very few resources. Um, some of these hospitals were unfortunately not very clean, and they didn't necessarily have the skilled nursing staff or the means to know how to feed these babies, so they didn't get good results. They were almost certainly doomed if the babies were only two or three pounds. How did Mo Dr. Cooney get the notion of displaying premature babies in incubators at right. places like the World's Fair, at places like Coney Island, and at Riverview Park here in Chicago? Yeah, well, so the incubator, the way we know it, was invented in France in the late 1800s and it was invented by an engineer not a doctor and so he displayed it with little babies in it and he was bragging about his invention it's so perfect it's almost automatic it requires no care he made it sound like a toaster oven he did it like a little show and so showmen started getting in on the act if it's so easy then let's make a show of it so Bailey of Burnham and Bailey had a show in London and the London Royal Aquarium had a show and in the United States you had Martin Cooney. Um, most of the showmen got out of this business very, very quickly because this was not a toaster oven. You needed very, very skilled nursing care to keep these babies alive. He stayed with it. And we're looking at, uh, we're looking at pictures. Is this in the World's Fair? Yeah, that's the 1933-1934 Century of Progress World's Fair in Chicago. It's kind of the, the World's Fair people forget about. It's not the devil in the white city or the Ferris wheel. Uh, basic question, what exactly is an incubator? Uh, an incubator is just a machine that keeps the baby warm. A uh, premature baby has an underdeveloped system, so that baby could freeze to death in room temperature. And especially back then, if you don't have central heating, room temperature could be in the 50s. So how many babies would he display at any one location? Usually about 20, not more. You know, and people and would pay how much? People would pay, usually it was a quarter. It sometimes varied. Um, and people could not imagine that babies this tiny could live. They had never seen such a thing. So at one point he was saying that he had to stop people from trying to stick their fingers in the incubator because he thought they must be wax. And uh, speaking of people speaking, sticking their fingers into incubators, Dr. Cooney brought other uh, practices uh, into play, including uh, the handling of the babies. Uh, describe the, some of the things that he did in addition to just keeping the babies in incubators. Right, well he was a big believer in holding the babies and showing the babies love. And he was uh, absolutely adamant that the babies be fed only breast milk, which was a pretty expensive proposition. If the mothers weren't on hand, he hired wet nurses. Um, and the premises were immaculate. And those were three things that you didn't necessarily see in hospitals. Where did these babies come from? Everywhere. So you could have been a millionaire or a pauper. It wouldn't matter. You couldn't get better medical care anywhere. Um, some of the parents were extremely wealthy and t over time the hospitals were saying to parents if you want your baby to live you have to go to the sideshow. Huh. His wife and his daughter played key roles because you say that they were involved with what you call the secret sauce. What did right. you mean? The nurses were the secret sauce and they still are in a NICU. The nurses have a lot to do with whether or not children can survive because they're there 24 seven. So his nurse was trained in Chicago at uh, was Maurice Porter Children's Hospital. Um, she was highly skilled. His daughter became an RN and he had a French nurse named Madame who was there for the entire run. 
Um, and Madame was definitely a show woman. She would take her diamond ring off her finger and slip it up a preemie's arm to demonstrate scale. But she was also an extraordinarily gifted nurse. What was the appeal of paying to see babies in an incubator? Well, first of all, people paid to see human beings on display on the sideshows. You had freak shows, you had midget shows, you had shows of indigenous peoples who were being demonstrated as quote unquote savages. Um, babies are fascinating to look at, and especially tinier babies than you could possibly imagine. But, you know, even if you go to a maternity ward now, it's kind of interesting to look. What was the uh, mortality rate, or better said, what was the survival rate of the babies that he took care of? It was about 85 percent, and that was later. In the beginning, he really didn't provide any documentation, but it was documented by the time he got to Chicago um, and later the New York World's Fair. It, people were keeping records of that. It should have been about a 90 percent mortality rate, and it was close to a 90 percent survival rate. And when you say it should have been, that's because, was that the mortality rate in the hospitals? What, no, what you would have expected for a baby that was that small. We're talking about two-pound baby before you had IV, before you had monitors, before you had any of the equipment that we have now. Here in Chicago, he made friends with a person named Dr. Julius Hess. Who was he? Dr. Hess is a very important part of how premature um, care for babies came to be in this country. Um, Dr. Hess was a highly credentialed doctor. He opened Sarah Morris, um, at Michael Reese Hospital, which was the first dedicated premature station for infants in the United States. Um, but Dr. Hess had met Martin Cooney at one of his sideshows. Um, never said exactly which one. It was either Riverside or the White City. He was Riverview. You mean. Riverview. Mm -hmm. Riverview. Um, he was inspired by Dr. Cooney. He said that frequently, and he learned a lot from Dr. Cooney. And later, when he published the first clinical volume of American neonatology right up front. He thanked Dr. Martin Cooney. Was Dr. Cooney, was he a showman? Did he really care <laughs> about the babies? I think both. You know, I think he, um, he got very wealthy doing this. I don't think he saw a conflict between altruism and self-interest. But and he never charged he, the parents, He never say. charged the parents. So again, you know, now if you don't have health insurance, you can't call Dr. Cooney to come help you. Um, if the child was an orphan or a child of the working poor, that child was going to be getting exactly the same care as the child of a millionaire. Dr. Cooney died in 1950, but you have actually met some people who were displayed in these incubators. Tell us about those folks. Oh, it was just wonderful to talk to them and meet them. There's four of them in Chicago who I know of and another Chicagoan who's now on the, uh, on the West Coast. Um, Here we're looking at a picture, and uh, the, two of the survivors yes. are the folks to, uh, at the far, the two women at the far right. No, the the so the woman at the very far right is the daughter of the woman next to her. Oh, her I name see. is Lucille Horn. She was 95 years old when we took that picture. Um, when she was born weighing two pounds in 1920, the obstetrician told her parents that there was no possibility she could live the day. Just prepare to bury her. Her father picked her up, wrapped her in a towel, hailed a taxi, and took her to Coney Island. Um, she passed away at the age of 96. Oh, my goodness. Uh, despite having saved an estimated 7,000 babies, he, uh, at the end of his life, he was forgotten. How come? Well, first of all, he died broke. Um, he lost all of his money at the New York World's Fair. He was still a little bit known at the end of his life, and then people forgot about him again, I think. Um, he wasn't somebody you would find in medical history books because um, medical history books are written by people mostly with institutional affiliations. You wouldn't really think to stop and credit a showman for this so much. And he was a showman because, as your book points out, he was not really a doctor, but a fascinating man. Don Raffle, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Again, the book is called The Strange Case of Dr. Cooney, How a Mysterious European Showman Saved Thousands of American Babies. You can read an excerpt on our website. And back with more right after this. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives.
There's a shortage of Latinos in STEM because there aren't enough opportunities. ComEd wants to change that, one program at a time. Celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month with Solar Spotlight. Building confidence, building bright minds, building the workforce of the future. One of the oldest forms of art is still practiced throughout the world, but it's only taught at one school in the United States. The art form is mosaics, and that school is right here in Chicago. It's been in operation for 13 years and has grown considerably since its founding by a local artist. And now the Chicago Mosaic School has relocated to a brand new and bigger home, ready to share its founder's enthusiasm for creating mosaics. Eddie Aruza recently visited the new location and puts all the pieces together. It's an art form that requires patience, a degree of precision, and quite a bit of attention to detail. And artists who are drawn to mosaics say it's as much a creative calling as a spiritual one. I was drawn to mosaics in a way that I cannot actually explain because there was a pull of my heart toward this. Breaking whether it's stone or glass and then putting them back together is in some ways a metaphor for my life. Since 2005, the Chicago Mosaic School has been teaching students how to put the pieces together. Artist Karen Ami informally started the school out of her home, wanting to share her lifelong passion for the art form. I had been teaching small groups out of my own studio and the word of mouth was that it was a really great thing to do and there was nothing like it. So I decided I wanted to create something bigger. And it's become quite a bit bigger. After outgrowing two previous locations, the Chicago Mosaic School is now in a new and prominent space in the Edgewater neighborhood. Ami says 48th Ward Alderman Harry Osterman invited Ami into his community, showing her various sites where she might relocate the school, and eventually connecting her with developers who created this new three-story home for the Chicago Mosaic School on West Granville Avenue. The school reopened its doors in June, with a big grand opening scheduled for September. Where we're standing now is, it's my dream. And these are out vertical. A number of international artists give workshops on an ongoing basis at the Chicago Mosaic School. One of them is Scottish mosaicist Dougal McInnes, who this summer marked his fifth year at the school. Modern mosaic artists can choose whatever hard and durable material they want to create their works. For McInnes, his main medium is slate, and every year he brings a suitcase full for his students. The slate comes from uh, near where I was brought up on the west coast of Scotland. And it was the very same slate that my tutor at art school used, so I knew this stuff. I used to play on it as a kid. Karen Ami says her education in the art of mosaics was one she had to pursue on her own. As a student at the Art Institute of Chicago, she says her instruction was strictly in contemporary art. And when she expressed interest in mosaics... I was told that um, I needed to get a plane ticket and go to Italy, <laughs> which isn't such a bad thing. And I did. What she brought home from Europe was an ever-growing love for the form, as well as contacts in Italy that she later brought to Chicago to give classes to her students. And for many years, Ami was importing expensive Italian tessera and smalti. Those are the little glass pieces used in traditional mosaics. But in 2012, she experienced a smalti windfall from the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis. The church was completed in 1914, but it took another 75 years for its astonishing mosaic interior, covered in 83,000 square feet of smalty, to be finished. When it was completed in 1988, all the leftover materials, all the extra materials, were swept up and put into a storage locker in St. Louis um, that was owned by the Bricklayers Union, and they didn't really know what to do with it because they don't use smalty. Ami purchased seven tons of the leftover Basilica Smalti for what she will only say was a very reasonable price, and it will provide students years, if not decades, of ample Smalti to work with. But students are encouraged to work with other materials as well. This work is by an Italian artist who teaches on occasion here at the Chicago Mosaic School, and it's representative of the kinds of materials they use here, some of them sourced locally. 
This is glass from the Kokomo Glass Factory in Indiana. This is flint from Michigan. And among the little bits of tessera used up here are white gold left over from the construction of the Basilica in St. Louis. The new location of the Chicago Mosaic School has 11 studio spaces for serious artists. But its mission, says Karen Ami, is to reach out and bring in the greater Chicago community. Included among the professional works on display in the entrance gallery, there is a wall of small mosaics made by casual visitors to the school. All sorts of people come in. We welcome them to make small pieces, to make a, a greater piece together. We're hoping to do some projects, not only in this neighborhood, but in neighborhoods throughout the city. Karen Ami's enthusiasm for the art of mosaics seems boundless, and she's determined to spread that joy throughout the city, even if she has to do it in bits and pieces. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Eddie Arusa. The Chicago Mosaic School is having its grand reopening this coming Friday from 6 to 10 p.m. On our website, you can find out more about the school and view a gallery of images of work that are on display there. And now to Carol Marine and a big anniversary for a Chicago institution in a conversation recorded earlier. This year marks the 150th anniversary of Lincoln Park Zoo. The zoo began with a gift of two pairs of swans from New York Central Park but has evolved into a world-class facility that now puts science and conservation at the heart of its mission. And it can make one boast that few institutions can. Throughout those 150 years, it's been free, and it remains the only privately managed free zoo in the United States. Here to talk about the anniversary and the changing role of zoos in the 21st century is Kevin Bell. He is president and CEO of Lincoln Park Zoo. Bell has led the zoo for the past 25 years, but he was first hired back in 1976 as the curator of birds. Right. My dad was actually a curator of birds before me at the Bronx Zoo in New York, so this was sort of a, a family tradition. I'm actually third generation zoo person. And I came to Lincoln Park, really, I was thinking my entire career would be as a bird curator. And I, I think that's what my dad felt was the best thing, uh, best job you could have in a zoo. And then, you know, when Dr. Fisher retired uh, in the mid-90s. And Dr. Fisher was? Dr. Fisher was the director of Lincoln Park Zoo following Marlon Perkins from 1962 until 1992. For those old enough to remember Marlon Perkins, a zoo parade, and I right. mean... Ark in the Park, well, zoo parade, yes. Zoo and then uh, Wild Kingdom right, was after that, right. yeah. And so, you were a kid who grew up in zoos, but when you were a kid growing up in zoos and even coming to this zoo, zoos then were really quite different than they are now. Yeah, you know, there's been a, a great paradigm shift over the years for, for zoos, and for many, many years, zoos were basically menageries. They were places where people came just for recreation, just to have fun. Uh, not really to learn that much about the animals, but to have a good time. And that's, I think, still important today, that we want people to have fun when they come to the zoo. But I think what has changed over the years is we, we obviously need to do more to support the conservation of the species that we have. So we want to teach the people more about, we want to connect them to the species that we have in our, in our institutions and teach them about how they can help these species in the wild. There is no longer a time when you dress a chimpanzee in a little outfit and parade them around, right? I mean, there was a kind of different entertainment concept about animals than there is now. Yeah, I think it was two things. First of all, we didn't understand chimp behavior that well. We also didn't understand the effect that doing that kind of thing was having on the people. One of the things we've learned through research is that when you do something like that and you make animals sort of anthropomorphize them and make them uh, in sort of human clothes or whatever, um, they tend to not feel that these are species that need to be saved, that there's a conservation need there. They look at them more as a fun, just recreational kind of, uh, of, a, of an animal that, that doesn't really need a lot of work. So we learned that you know, we can't do that type of thing from the public standpoint and also from the animal standpoint. The chimpanzees, back in the 60s and 70s, a lot of animals were hand-raised. Uh, and what happened is a lot of the, those animals weren't socially the best animals uh, for breeding in the, in the future. So the whole concept was really, you know, it was fine at the time. We didn't understand it, but now we know a lot better and we would never go back 
to that again. And we used to think too, did we not, that um, concrete and drains and hoses right. were the most sanitary, most reasonable way to house animals, and that went away how long ago? Well, when I came to the zoo in 76, uh, the birdhouse at Lincoln Park Zoo had concrete and tile, and it was basically made so that you could hose the cage down really well, soap it, and clean it, and disinfect it. Um, but the problem with that, of course, is, yeah, it may keep disease down to a certain degree, but it tells the people nothing about where these animals come from. There's no connection to the wild at all. So really, as we went through the evolution of zoos and, and the kind of messaging that we were doing, uh, we wanted to explain not just about the animal, but the habitat that the animal comes from. So that's how we created these now nice exhibits where people can feel like they're stepping into a part of Africa or a part of Asia. But there are still people, are there not, who are critical that they feel there isn't a balance between the need of the animal and the putting them on display. There's still some tension there, correct? I, I think there, there are anti-zoo folks that are out there. Um, you know, it would be great if right now that there was not any need for conservation in the wild. And, and, but I think that the important thing is right now, we need to get that concept across to folks that a lot of these animals populations are in, in deep trouble and we need to be able to protect them. Zoos are a way that we can tell that story. We can tell not only about the biology of the animals and, and their behaviors, but we can also tell about what's happening in their wild habitats and the need we, we all have to take care of that. One of the things that struck me was when a, a beloved zoo animal, one that's been around for a long time, dies, there's a kind of service. I mean, there's a real sense of, of mourning and loss. Does one immediately come to mind for you that was really personal? Well, there's one that really affected me a lot. It was uh, early on in my tenure as zoo director, and we had lost uh, one of our male polar bears. And so we had a small service up at the polar bear exhibit. And if you remember, we, have, we still have underwater viewing for our polar bears. And uh, we had to we let people say some remarks and whatnot. We talked about the polar bear. Uh, at the end, one of the uh, children that were at the ceremony came up to me and he said, you know, I really connected with Mike the polar bear a lot. He said, I would come to the zoo and I'd go up to the window and I'd put my hand up on the window. And Mike would swim towards the window and he'd put his paw up on the window and he'd push off right at that spot. And he knew it was me and we had that connection. And, you know, I didn't have the heart to tell him that Mike did that with a lot of the kids that came to the zoo. But that connection was so special and that, that, that child today, I'm sure, is interested in polar bear conservation and, and climate change, global warming, because of those experiences he had with polar bears as, a, as an infant. So this anniversary, what will it mark and what, will, what do you see changing after the 150th year? Well, you know, it, it's great to look back at the history, but I think zoos continue to evolve. We can continue to learn more about our animals. We continue to learn more about our visitors and how we can get our messages across. If you look at Lincoln Park Zoo, uh, when we went private from the, from the city of Chicago back in 1995, we were basically a recreation facility. We started to grow our conservation science programs, as you uh, mentioned in the beginning. Uh, now, what we're focusing also on our uh, neighborhood outreach. So we're looking at our engagement with communities across Chicago and not bringing animals to those communities, but bringing programs to those communities and working with them, especially some of the communities that's harder for the kids to get into the zoo. So it's really sort of expanding our footprint, footprint throughout Chicago and making sure that you know we have a chance to interact with all the communities. Jane Goodall was on this broadcast a number of times and she has partnered with the Lincoln Park mm -hmm. Zoo in recent years. W what has that given you? I think, the, you know, for, first of all, great apes uh, and chimps in particular have been a big part of Lincoln Park Zoo history. That was something Dr. Fisher was very, very involved with when he was director. Uh, but then when, again, we built the new uh, great ape house, uh, the Reagan Center for African Apes, uh, we created a, a, a sort of a conservation center around that called the Fisher Center, named after Dr. Fisher. And uh, we really made a connection with uh, the folks in Africa that uh, Jane was very involved in, in Gombe National Park. And the chimps that she studied, we also had a connection with that research that was going on as well. And that kind of led us to expand our chimp chimpanzee programs, both in terms of welfare, in terms of conservation, and in terms of behavior. 
enhancing the science further. Right. Thank you. So, congratulations on this splendid anniversary and what, what you've done with the well, zoo. Well, thank you so much. Kevin Bell, CEO of Lincoln Park Zoo. You can find out more about the zoo and its 150th anniversary on our website. We'll be back with more right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast to get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. And that is our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily e-alert and join us tomorrow night live at 7. The new methods and big money behind the perennial influx of political ads and tap dancing hip hop and a park district field house filled with art and community in the Austin neighborhood. We leave you tonight with a 9-11 memorial from Chicago Fire Department Engine Company number 70. They place a flag in front of the firehouse with the name of each New York firefighter lost in the attacks. Now for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.